My name is Elizabeth Jeffrey, co-chair of the program committee for East Central Illinois Master Naturalists. Before we start, a little housekeeping. Participants will be muted and images hidden to better show the presentation. Please use chat to ask your questions, which Dr. Berenbaum will answer at the end. Dr. May Berenbaum joined the faculty of the Department of Entomology at the University of Illinois here in Urbana in 1980. She has served as head of the department since 1992 and has held the Swanland Chair of Entomology since 1996. Dr. Berenbaum's research is focused on interactions between flowering plants and insects, ranging from pollinators to crop pests, and on the application of ecological principles towards sustainable management practices. A member of the National Academy of Sciences since 94, she chaired the 2007 Committee on the Status of Pollinators in North America. She testified before Congress on issues relating to honeybee health and pollinator decline. She is devoted to public engagement in science and has authored six books about insects for the general public, including a, a honeybee cookbook. And she founded several outreach and citizen science activities, including Bee Spotter and the UI Pollinata Pollinatarium. The community may know her best for the annual Insect Fear Film Festival, now in its 38th year. In 2011, she received the Tyler Prize for Environmental Achievement, and in 2014, she was presented with the National Medal of Science from President Barack Obama. As next week is Pollinator Week, we hope you will all leave here today with a message for the general public about all doing our piece to protect our pollinators. Dr. Berenbaum, we give you a very warm welcome. Thank you, Dr. Jeffrey, and uh, thank you all for coming today. I mean, it's a beautiful day, and I know you could be out enjoying real life flowers and real life pollinators, so thank you for uh, coming inside and sharing this time with me and letting me uh, share with you my enthusiasm for uh, uh, flowers and pollinators. So um, with that, let me... I, don't, I have it muted. Stop <coughs> my video. I did not stop my video. There we go. Um, and uh, talk about the pollinator apocalypse, if there is such a thing. Um, and... Uh, so there's been a lot of talk about in the insect apocalypse or the pollinator apocalypse and it actually uh it's worth uh, looking into the origin of the word it's actually from the greek meaning revelation it's from the book of daniel uh which is an account of the life of the prophet daniel who was saved from his enemies by god and who learned in one of his many visions that israel would similarly be saved from its enemies in the end of days from Daniel uh, 12, there shall be a time of trouble such as there never was since there was a nation even to that same time. Kind of sounds like 2020, doesn't it? Well, non-biblically, an apocalypse is considered to be a disaster on a cataclysmic scale. And in fact, there's a whole genre of ap apocalyptic fiction that imagines a sudden catastrophic event that causes the collapse of civilization. Now, causes can be natural and out of human control or human and the result of evil or greed. And just a few examples of the genre, uh, Death of Grass way back in 1956 was the story of, of a mutation of a, a virus, an imagine, a fictional virus, Chung Li virus, that wipes out all members of the grass family, including grain crops with predictable cataclysmic consequences. Hot House from 1962 imagines Earth getting locked in its orbit facing the sun where uh, plants over-dominate all other life forms by basically photosynthesizing nonstop. Uh, uh, the blight is when a powerful international organization aimed at world domination does so by not, uh, killing all the trees. And as far as I know, there's, there's really only one novel, apocalyptic novel about 
the loss of any arthropod. And, and this is kind of a cheat. It's not all insects. Uh, well, all insects disappear. This is Charles Pellegrino's dust. All insects disappear because of an intermittent cyclical extinction event. Humans had nothing to do with it. Um, this intermittent cyclical extinction event, which happens every 30 million years or so, is not documented in the actual fossil record. But it was, uh, the reason I think it's a cheat is that yes, all the insects disappear, but all the ecological niches are subsequently filled by mites, which are also arthropods. So that, I don't, did not find this very scary, but many readers did. But uh, in November of uh, 2018, uh, the New York Times ran a story, a cover story, on the magazine section about what they dubbed the insect apocalypse. And uh, this generated a conversation on a global scale about uh, what exactly was going on uh, and uh, recurring questions of whether there is or is not an actual apocalypse. Now, uh, what triggered your stories uh, was a series of, of studies that had appeared in a relatively short period of time suggesting that in fact there were massive declines of arthropods particularly insects happening all um, many places in the world one of the notable ones that was mentioned in that story was was published in 19 and 2017 it was a study done in germany over a period of 27 years in 63 nature uh pre preserves uh that involved um sort of citizen scientists doing uh, a series of uh, regular surveys of insect biomass. So just the weight of flying insects, not the number of species, but the weight. And over this 27 year period, this study documented a seasonal decline of 76% in the weight of insect flying insects and midsummer decline of 82%. Uh, this was a staggering amount. And uh, this study received a lot of attention and some of the attention was critical. Uh, in that uh, there were some weaknesses of the study. First of all, biomass is not the same as biodiversity. Biomass, you could have uh, large quantities of a single species, and if that single species disappears, then you have a decline in biomass, but not much impact on biodiversity, strictly speaking, the number of species. Sampling was not done in the same plots over the 27-year study span, so data didn't really depict a long-term trend for any given site, and there were only flying uh, insects sampled. A, a trap called a malaise trap, a malaise trap was used to acquire the insect samples, which leaves many other parts of uh, the commu plant communities where insects could have been uh, increasing in diversity. Then early in 2018, uh, well, in uh, October of 2018, uh, there was a study that came out that was equally shocking. It came out in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, and it, com it was a study done in a rainforest in Puerto Rico comparing a two-year period of sampling in 1976 to 77 to a two-year uh, period of sampling at the same place, 2012 to 2013, documenting, as you see in the, in the uh, figure here, uh, massive declines between the early and later samples um, in both ground arthropods and canopy arthropods. Uh, the news coverage was quite breathless. One of the most disturbing articles I've ever read, scientist says of study detailing climate-driven bug apocalypse. I'm pretty sure the scientist is not the one who called it a bug apocalypse, but people were uh, alarmed at these uh, reports. And again, the scientific community offered some uh, critiques of the methods, mostly that in this two, uh, two sets of two year samples, they failed to take into account population cycles of insects, which routinely hit highs and lows. There are sudden losses in biodiversity that, especially in the tropics, according to hurricanes and, and uh, successional changes. And these were not taken into account. It was just drawing a line between two points, basically. Uh, the authors responded, uh, and there was uh, a little cryptically, uh, basically questioned some of the statistical analysis of their critics, and then offered yet another uh, um, correction because they misidentified one of the arthropods in their survey. So that's another problem is identifying um, species in order to calculate diversity. 
So early, this is the one, early in uh, 2019, another shocking story came out. This was based on a meta-analysis, a review of the literature. Uh, and uh, this review demonstrated um, or documented a 40% uh, that, uh, of the insect species evaluated, 40% were threatened with extinction. Um, and some, in fact, aquatic taxa, those in, uh, living in the water, were uh, in, at risk of, ex of extinction. Um, they identified among the main causes conversion to intensive agriculture, but also pollutants, uh, invasive species, and climate change. And this also generated headlines in several different languages and uh, dire forecasts for the uh, survival of humankind and also elicited criticisms by other uh, scientists. Two of the main critiques of this insect, uh, of this literature review, first of all, when these authors reviewed the literature, they used the search term decline, which immediately biased the results that they would find. That they had done a comparable search looking at increases rather than declines in abundance. It's not clear they would have found the pattern they found. The other problem was there was a um, a bias in the geographic areas where these studies had been carried out. Their search was in English, so uh, they, th the studies that they cited were published primarily in North America and Europe. North America and Europe do not possess most of Earth's biodiversity, especially arthropod diversity, so it's unclear whether this non-random sample of the world's biomes uh, was necessarily predictive of global uh, biodiversity loss. At least six studies in 2019 were focused just on bee decline uh, in, based on museum collection specimens, uh, bumblebees in particular. Uh, so there's six different studies uh, where authors went into museums, pulled out drawers of, of specimens, and then documented um, based on the species and how they were represented in past collections that in fact bumblebees were in decline. And now the thing to remember invariably when there are stories about bees that are covered by newspapers or any other media, bad puns seem to be irresistible and you will see many more of these. So the buzz about bumblebees isn't good, right? Very original. Um, now again, these studies all could be criticized uh, by the limitations of doing museum-based stu studies. First of all, if you're looking at specimens in a museum, you're provide, you can get information about the presence of species, but you cannot get and for anything about their absence. You can't collect what isn't there, uh, and you don't know why it wasn't there. Sampling is typically biased toward places that are accessible or uh, that have populations that are interested in biodiversity. So the sampling is biased toward, uh, in, in the Galapagos Islands, uh, the island with the airport typically has more biodiversity than the islands that are harder to get to. The same thing across the U.S., the county that hosts the land-grant university with the entomology department always has exceptionally high levels of insect diversity because people are way more, entomologists are way more likely to characterize what's easy to get to. There's also a bias toward species that are easily identified. Often uh, collectors won't collect what they, if they, a specimen if they can't recognize it. Uh, and you don't know how space limited any specific museum is. And often museums have to uh, discard duplicate specimens because they just don't have space. Now, the fact that some high profile publications have been criticized for methodological irregularities or limitations emphasizes the difficulty of documenting insect biodiversity to relatively poorly developed uh, state of counting methods. Um, and you, it's very, also very hard to project population trends due to the deficiencies of sampling. There, we don't have baseline studies on which to, to uh, compare contemporary sampling. So uh, there's a lot of guesswork involved and uh, as a result, some of the population uh, changes that have been documented are not particularly robust, particu especially because many insects have these boom and bust cycles. You probably noticed them that there's really good year for mosquitoes this year, actually, and that last year was rel 
we weren't so bothered by mosquitoes, but it's very typical for insects to have boom and bust. And you can kind of see the pattern here with one of these very famous uh, um, surveys of the size of the overwintering populations of monarch butterflies who undergo a, a heroic uh, migration every year. They overwinter as adults and the, East Coast, the Eastern US population overwinters in a tiny area uh, in the Michu uh, near Michoacan, Mexico, in the Oyamel fir forest, where the abundance of over the overwintering population is estimated by the actually the area covered by monarch butterflies. All right, so interpreting these patterns without taking into account species specific ecological attributes such as boom and bust cycles and methodologies is challenging. So there's two populations of monarchs in uh, North America there's the Eastern North American monarchs that overwinter in in the fir forests of Mexico. And then there's the Western population, which overwinters along uh, the Pacific coast. So the, the Western population also has uh, a pattern of decline and also typical boom and bust cycles. And uh, this is a study uh, that reported a 97% population drop of average historical abundances between the 80s and the mid 10s, 2010s. And, and a, dro a spectacular drop in 2018-2019 with the conclusion that the available studies reinforce the hypotheses that overwintering habitat loss and loss of central California breeding habitat as well as pesticide use are likely to be an important contributor to decline but it's really difficult to estimate the decline because of methodological changes though so that the authors had to use a statistical um, trick, as it were, to estimate how the uh, pre-1995 samples compared to post-95 samples. And you can see uh, this gray area is, is basically the, the error range. So uh, the, the peak could have been here, it could have been here, could have been here. And how steep the decline, this 97% decline, is based on the very highest point, which overall may well have been an anomalous year. Now, none of these niceties um, is discussed at, at great length during media coverage. Uh, this is an example of how sometimes uh, the predictions get ahead of the biology, California's most famous uh, butterflies and a uh, death spiral and extinction spiral, an alarming precipitous drop in the western monarch butterfly population in California could spell doom for the species, a scenario that biologists say could also plunge bug-eating birds and other species into similar death spirals. Don't think the biologists were saying that uh, the decline of the monarch would cause uh, a plunge in bug-eating bird populations because very few uh, birds can handle monarch butterflies because they famously uh, store or sequester poisonous substances from their asclepiaceous or milkweed host plants. They're called cardiac glycosides or cardenolides. They're heart poisons that induce vomiting. And here you see a blue jay attempting to eat a monarch butterfly. And up there uh, you see the consequence here. And subsequently, the blue jays that have experienced monarchs will uh, not only avoid them, but anything that even vaguely resembles a monarch. So um, uh, that's at least one thing you don't have to worry about. People are worried all, all around the world. And just like politics, the insect apocalypses might be local. There may be local uh, losses of high profile charismatic insects like monarch butterflies. But does that mean, what does that mean relative to all insects? Um, how broadly are trends in geographically restricted studies applicable elsewhere? Uh, and here you see the concern Hong Kong is worried about moths. The insectageddon in uh, New Zealand uh, is, uh, well, has us all buggered as it were. I told you about the bad puns. Uh, here you have a, a, a concern in California, insects are disappearing in India. Uh, and uh, so everyone has a slightly different take. So the insect apocalypse has uh, really gripped people's imagination, but it's worth mentioning, it's not even our first insect apocalypse. If you do a Google Trends uh, analysis, Google Trends is a site or an app, I guess, on Google that lets you uh, survey uh, searches on uh, Google over time to see uh, 
when people are searching for particular terms. And here you see, uh, this is basically right here is when the New York uh, Times Magazine article appeared and a lot of interest in insect apocalypses, but then there's this bizarre peak all the way back in 2004. And I'm thinking, I'm an entomologist, I don't remember an apocalypse in 2004. And this was over the top language in a news story about, um, I'm sorry, the emergence of uh, the 17 year cicadas in the, in the Northeast. It's one of the very large broods, brood nine, I think of the, uh, brood 10 of uh, uh, the periodical 17 year cicada. Uh, and that, that's one headline that got a lot of traction here. Um, the apocalypse was a term that attracted people's attention too, but it referred mostly to uh, 2007 uh, concern about colony collapse disorder. And that concern arose uh, in February of 2007 because in fact managed bee populations had uh, declined and uh, in February half of all of America's bees are transported to California almond orchards in order to provide pollination services and uh, again the New York Times triggered a worry about the bee apocalypse with story that appeared in February in the business section about whether or not the almond crop would be endangered but there's still the apocalypse interest going into the present. So we've, we've actually been discussing a crisis of biodiversity since 1992 when Edward O. Wilson, legendary uh, biologist, entomologist, uh, coined the term, uh, or at least first used the term uh, in his 1992 book, The Diversity of Life. That was uh, 27 years ago. Uh, and uh, pollinator, uh, biodiversity loss became really uh, attracted attention around 1996 with the uh, uh, publication of a book that hasn't really gotten the, the uh, credit it deserves for raising awareness. There's a book called The Forgotten Pollinators written by Steve Buckman and Gary Nabon. And, and in this book, they basically uh, looked across uh, years of study to demonstrate a very consistent pattern across many different groups of pollinators. So not just um, birds, but also uh, bees, butterflies, uh, bats, and the like, all of them uh, seeming to decline in abundance and diversity. Well, this uh, started a conversation, and in uh, 1996, the subsidiary body on scientific, technical, and technological advice of the Convention on Biodiversity, which is a global meeting every year, was held in Montreal, led to the establishment of an international pollinator con conservation initiative in 96, the third conference of the parties on this Convention on Biodiversity, which was uh, in Buenos Aires, led to uh, uh, the decision 3.2 pollinators became a priority group. October 1998, the International Workshop on Conservation and Sustainable Use of Pollinators in Agriculture led to the San Paolo De Declaration on Pollinators. In 1999, the USDA and the US Geological Survey joined uh, forces in Logan, Utah to discuss the importance of pollinator loss on managed and wild uh, um, populations in the US. In 2000, in the fifth meeting of the uh, Conference of the Parties of the Con Convention on Biodiversity, uh, led to an international initiative for conservation and sustainable use of pollinators. To, to, uh, April 2002, the International Pollinator Initiative was approved. Um, in 2002, um, uh, an NGO called the North American Pollinator Protection Campaign approached the National Research Council of the National Academy of Sciences, that's the research arm of the National Academy, the ones that carry out um, what are called consensus studies. This is an objective group of scientists who uh, examine all the literature on a particular issue and then make recommendations on policy based on evidence. Uh, and uh, they suggested a study. The study re was approved, received fundings, got started and uh, basically got underway in 2004, which happened to be a year when many different papers came out documenting long-term population declines in all kinds of pollinators. This is a study on British moths published in 2002 that was based on 35 years of light traps. Moths, of course, come to lights. So Rotham said is, a, uh, is actually was founded in uh, the mid 19th century uh, as, as a agricultural research station in Britain. 
they showed of 338 large moths, macro moths, 50, over half of them displayed significant declines. Uh, here you see them decreasing. And in contrast, only about a fifth of them showed any uh, increases. And so Britain, basically, Great Britain is very good about its natural resources and many naturalists there that uh, um, are amateurs that, that monitor things. And uh, the whole country is gridded off into 10 kilometer squares. So it's, uh, there's a grid system in, in which um, biodiversity measures can be mapped and compared. And in science, uh, there appeared an article uh, um, comparing survey data on butterflies from 1968 to 1972 and then 95 to 99 across Britain and found that butterflies had disappeared from 13% of the previously occupied squares. The projection was made if insects elsewhere in the world are similarly sensitive, the uh, known global extinction rates of vertebrate and plant species have an unrecorded parallel among the invertebrates strengthening the hypothesis that the natural world is experiencing a sixth major extinction event in history. Uh, again, uh, British bees, Brit the Brit Britons are very good at uh, natural history observations, particularly British hoverflies and British bees. In 2006, these mice et al. reported declines both in, in uh, uh, the Netherlands and in Britain documenting uh, the, and documented the geographic extent of these declines. Uh, so here you see the uh, species changes, decreases are the reddish and increases are the blues. And definitely in, in Britain, bees are in decline and the serpids are in decline. Uh, Dutch bees are also in decline. Serpids seem to be holding their own in the Netherlands. But this was uh, another um, awareness raising paper. In 2006, that National Research Council study um, was released. I was uh, privileged to chair that committee. Uh, there are experts on every group of pollinator on that committee. And what we were able to show after about 18 months and 3,000 references, uh, that yes, there was a very clear po uh, downward population trend for honeybees in the United States since data began to be collected around uh, 1945. Uh, the number of managed colonies had dropped more than half, so about 5.5 down to 2.5 million colonies. The other, the problem with wild populations, we did not have data. It was a staggering realization that we had failed to, to keep watch over the the status of uh, pollinators on which we depend, other than the managed pollinators. Uh, now, this is uh, these findings really against the backdrop of of a disturbing pattern of accelerated extinction rates across all kinds of taxa, other than insects. People tend to overlook insects, but there are consistent patterns across vertebrates of of an accelerated pace of extinction. Um, and uh, that led people to believe that this was, uh, since this rate of extinction was unparalleled in geologic history, that in fact, humans had, had led the planet into a, an extinction period. So the history of, of um, Earth has been a series of disasters. Uh, and these are called mass extinction events. And some go uh, back to the Ordovician, they're basically uh, five, uh, over which three, qu uh, three quarters to 90%, 95% of the known organisms on uh, species on the planet went extinct. And the causes tended to be geologic events. So uh, volcanic activity, increase in methane, asteroid impacts, uh, rapid cooling. Um, and uh, the idea began to gain popularity that that maybe humans for the first time in the history of the planet were causing extinctions the same way that asteroids for example had caused extinctions uh, so this is a press release from 1998 um, announcing that uh, this mass extinction event is the fastest in earth's four and a half billion year history that's phrase sixth extinction uh, sort of gained common parlance uh, E.O. Wilson is sort of a gifted writer, uh, as well as a, a 
the remarkable, astute biologist uh, projected these contemporary extinction rates and estimated that by 2100, half of Earth's biodiversity would be extinct. He proposed, instead of uh, the sixth extinction, the age of loneliness, which in its Greco-Latinate roots is the Eremozoic, the age of loneliness. It never really caught on. But in 2000, Paul Crutzen and Eugene Sturmer introduced the term the Anthropocene uh, to introduce this age of human-caused extinctions. So uh, it really didn't take us that long to go from defining biodiversity in 1992 to realizing today that we're in imminent danger of losing um, all of it. Now the thing about extinction, um, particularly since 1700, it's the one form of environmental change in which human involvement is impossible to deny. We have it on, and we have photographic evidence, we have uh, documentary evidence of all sorts that we are causing extinctions by uh, human disturbance, recreation, uh, war and work, transportation, energy production, over harvesting, agriculture, land clearing, urban development, invasive species and disease. And uh, we can't, unlike apocalyptic fish fiction, blame it on alien viruses, planetary aberrations or cyclical geologic dis disruptions. So uh, the more people delved into the literature, the more alarming the picture gets for insects. Um, this is a paper in Science Magazine, very high profile journal of defaunation in the Anthropocene, which really for the first time brought insects into the discussion. And in fact, of all the insects with International Union of Conservation of Nature documented population trends, a third are declining. Um, 30 to 60% in the UK have uh, uh, declining ranges. Globally, a, com a compiled index of all invertebrates over the past 40 years uh, show a 40, uh, overall 45% decline. And a meta-analysis of the effects of anthropogenic or human-originated disturbances on Lepidoptera shows overall uh, Lepidoptera are uh, displaying lower diversity rather than uh, increasing in diversity, particularly in human disturbed sites. Now, insects may be at particular risk of decline because of uh, two aspects of, uh, that characterize the, the group, the class insecta. Um, most insects that go extinct are narrow habitat specialists and are associated um, with hosts, either plant or vertebrate hosts uh, that themselves have gone extinct. So uh, these are of, often overlooked causes of extinction. Um, when, for example, the Hoya, uh, which is a New Zealand bird that went extinct, going extinct with it was uh, the bird louse that lived on it, only on its feathers, the only place that lived on earth. Uh, so insects are more at risk because as a group, they're more specialized in their habitats and their habits. And that's how they became so diverse in the first place. They divide the world up more finely than most, any, most other animal groups. So moths, which don't get the publicity that butterflies have, more than 90% of North American lepidopterans are moths. As caterpillars, 90% of them feed on three or fewer plant families, very specialized. So here's one genus, uh, which you may know, Anothera, which is uh, evening prim primrose. There are four species of this tiny little moth genus, uh, well, the moths are tiny, the genus Mompha, there are four species of Mompha that feed on one genus of plant, and they do this by specializing on different parts of the plants. Here's Mompha rufo cristatella, uh, which forms galls on flower stems of Gaura, biennial Gaura, which grows in Illinois prairies, and here's Mompha stellata, which bores into the flowers on Anothra biennis. In fact, right here in central Illinois, actually in part in my front yard, my graduate student, uh, Terry Harrison, uh, back in 2005, identified a previously unknown species. Uh, so this is again, a little brown moth, just like the momphids. It's agonopteryx and uh, very hard to tell them apart. Uh, and he uh, described in the, in the literature were three species of agonopteryx that feed on two plants in the rotation, the family Rutaceae, the citrus family. There's Xanthoxylum, uh, prickly ash, or Telia trifoliata, the uh, wafer ash. Uh, and Terry noticed that, that in fact there was a fourth species that was time displaced. It fed on the same hosts, but later in the season. So here's the key, and you can see um, 
that if it's feeding on uh, telia trifoliata uh, wafer ash, um, if it has a if it's abundant in late June and in late July, it's a new species, previously undescribed. He described it, named it after his wife. Um, and here are the ones that were known previously. So right here in central Illinois, there's insect diversity we did not even know about because these species are capable of dividing up the habitat and the resources so finely to uh, allow this diversification. Okay, why does it matter if we lose species? Because in terrestrial communities in particular, insects provide ecosystem services. So ecosystem services are the uh, benefits that people obtain from the natural world. Uh, and insects are so diverse, they contribute to all kinds of ecosystem services. They provide products, food, water, uh, biochemicals, genetic resources. They form regulatory services, including uh, disease regulation, water regulation, water purification, and especially pollination, uh, as well as supporting services. Termites are very important in soil formation. Uh, insects are the major recyclers um, on the planet. Dung beetles, uh, carrion feeders. Uh, they uh, provide population regulation for uh, other insects. Uh, predaceous insects keep other insects, uh, plant feeding insects under control. They feed vertebrates and they pollinate flowers. Because 90% of insects have a complex life cycle where it goes from egg to larva to pupa to adults called complete metamorphosis, uh, they, they can contribute different ecological ecosystem uh, services over the course of their life cycles. Um, they're important uh, prey for vertebrates, including bats, rodents, and birds, also invertebrates, including wasps, spiders, and bugs. They provide ecosystem services such as detritus processing. You don't really think about it, but these caterpillars, these are clothes moths. You find them in the wool in your, in your closet, but they actually evolve to feed on the fur and skin and um, feathers of dead vertebrates. Um, there's uh, parasites of, of other, uh, mo there's some moth caterpillar that are parasites of other insects. There are moth caterpillars that are predators. Uh, this one is the sloth moth, which lives on algae that grows on the fur of sloths um, in Central and South America. It was a mystery from decades as to where the caterpillars of this moth occurred, because they were not on the body of the sloth moth. But apparently sloths defecate once a week. They come down from the trees to the forest floor, defecate, the moths flutter out and lay eggs in sloth dung, and that's where the caterpillars grow. But uh, again, amazing diversity, but it's we're the pollinators are what we're talking about. So remember some of the criticisms of the studies with biomass matters. Yes, but it's not bi a species diversity. Species of insects in particular may not be interchangeable with respect to the ecosystem services they contribute. So around the world, most species of figs are pollinated by only one or two species of tiny fig wasp in the family uh, Agionidae, the, the fig, fig wasp family. Uh, they're tiny. Uh, there's nothing else that pollinates them. Figs have a very strange uh, reproductive biology where the flowers are actually in, this, it's called a syconium, and the flowers are inside. The wasp can get in and pollinate them. They use some of, the, of these uh, structures to raise their uh, larvae and others uh, just um, to the, some feed the larvae, others are entered and the uh, wasp will pick up pollen and distribute it. It's, and otherwise, if there are no wasps, there's no pollination. And we discovered that the hard way here in, in uh, the US. Um, we produce, uh, uh, California produces 98% of America's figs, uh, 6,400 acres, 31,000 tons of fruit, $15 million industry. Commercial fig cultivation began in 1880 with the importation from the Mediterranean, where figs are native, of Smyrna figs. 14,000 cuttings were distributed in 1881. Nothing produced mature fruit. And the reason they did not is that no one knew that the pollinators didn't come with the fruits. It took eight years for investigators to identify the proper fig wasp species in Europe, bring them back, figure out this life cycle, and allow it to uh, acclimate to California before we actually could have a fig industry. Not just any fig wasp would do. And in the natural, in natural communities, figs are even more important in that they are keystone species. So the fig tree 
they grow, they're cosmopolitan in tropical communities. And the thing about the figs is they continuously produce fruit and everything in their forest communities can eat these fruits. So we got all kinds of vertebrates. We got bats and we've got primates and we've got birds and we've got rodents. Figs fall in the water and fish eat them. Uh, there are uh, all kinds of, here are the fig wasps, the pollinators, um, and all kinds of insects uh, eat the foliage. They are what are called keystone species. So just like a keystone holds two halves of an arch together, the keystone species holds all the pieces of a community together. This is a study that was done in Eastern Australia uh, of uh, fig trees. 84 bird species visited these trees. And surprisingly, 55 of those 84 species were not frugivorous. They didn't feed on the fig fruits. They were insectivores. So insectivorous birds in fig trees increase in abundance when the figs are ripening. And as the figs ripen, here you see the insectivores, figs ripen, uh, the uh, fig wasp come out and the fig wasp are an important source of protein for these birds. Once the figs ripen, then the fruit feeding birds come in. So these stingless fig wasps are uh, an important source of food, particularly in drier habitats. And the fact that the fig trees produce ripening fruits continuously all year long means that fig wasps are also available all year long, including times when other insects are not available. So they're not interchangeable. If you go into biology textbooks, invertebrates are depicted as anonymous and interchangeable in, in food webs. And when we get specific names of these vertebrates, and then when we look at the, at the insects, there's just a, a couple that are singled out or they're sort of anonymously uh, compiled in a little corner here. Um, insects, here we go. How many thousands of species are represented in this terrestrial food web uh, by these two little sad figures? And again, biomass is not everything. Great tits are insectivorous. They feed their young like so many birds do with insects. But this was a study that, that showed um, that size matters, at least uh, if you're feeding your offspring and you're a great tit. And uh, what happens is they feed initially as the season progresses on spiders. But after a point, the caterpillars that are present in the community get big enough that it's, it's worth the great tit's time to collect them. So what happens if you look at the triangles, uh, caterpillars are not popular until they reach a particular mass, then they are collected and fed to, the, to birds. So uh, a, a family of great tits could fail to produce uh, offspring um, if there are no large caterpillars in the community because it's energetically not supportive and su sustainable for them to bring in, to make multiple foraging tests bringing in small species or small individuals of a particular species. So uh, it's not just biodiversity, uh, it's not just biomass, it's also uh, more than biomass in that uh, not all species are equally edible and some are outright toxic. We talked about the monarch. Monarch uh, and its relative, the queen, both the Danaea species, sequester these poisons, uh, cardiac glycosides, from milkweeds. And they're about the same size and they share a color pattern with the black swallowtail. They're actually some morphs, uh, there's a lot of uh, variation in, in uh, uh, color. Uh, often freshman undergraduates will mistake black swallowtails for monarchs. Uh, fortunately, they don't eat caterpillars because if you eat monarchs, you get very sick. If you eat black swallowtails, you probably, well, I don't know how you would feel, but uh, if you were a bird, you'd be better off. So species matter. And we know that insects have gone extinct. We know that pollinators in particular have gone extinct. And this was a compilation we did for our study, an NRC study on the status of pollinators in North America. Um, and here is a list of the many documented extinctions, particularly on islands. So pollinators on islands have trouble. And these are the, this is the Hawaiian islands and the uh, very sad stories of, of extinctions on these islands, um, particularly in the leeward um, uh, islands. Uh, many extinctions uh, of um, moth species, more so than butterflies. Again, because of human disturbance. This is the sad story of Laysan Island, Island where um, uh, rabbits were introduced. Uh, not a great idea. 
the rabbits basically completely destroyed uh, the plant community, which in turn had devastating effects on uh, the bird community. Here you see what uh, this is Laysan uh, prior to the introduction of rabbits, and his, this is what the same location looked like after rabbits were introduced. Native uh, plants went extinct, and the native insect specialists on those plants went extinct with them. Seven out of eight weevil species, six out of eight noctuid moths. And in fact, the Laysan noctuid moth, which was, is now called Hypena laysanensis, this was endemic, found only in Laysan Island, and it was likely the main species, I'm sorry, my cat just stepped on the, okay, sorry. It was the main species eaten by a bird known as the Laysan miller bird. It was known by that name because it, it fed primarily on the noctuid moths known as, Laysa, uh, as millers, uh, and probably the loss of the Laysan miller moth uh, contributed to the decline of the, um, the miller bird. Host specificity leaves many species vulnerable in their larval stages. Um, you probably know about chestnut blight, a fungal pathogen of, of American chestnut, first detected in 1905. Within 50 years, 80% of all American chestnuts were dead. More than 200 million acres of chestnuts were eliminated. At least 60 species of insects were known to feed on chestnut the genus, and at least seven were restricted to the American chestnut, Castania dentata. So about half of the 60 species of Lepidoptera, butterflies and moths, known to occur on, on species in the genus Castania, had hosts in other families, but more than 20% fed only on um, Castania species. About 30% uh, were recorded on a few other genera in, this, in the family. Um, seven of the species that were specific for American chestnut, were presumed to have gone extinct by 1978. So if you go to Bug Guide, this is what you see, um, no default photo. These are the seven species, two have since been recovered, but when their host goes, so go the insects. And the problem is we don't even know what's out there. Um, less than one-tenth of one percent of all known species have been evaluated for their uh, conservation status. So. Uh, there's not a large number of 583 that are known to be, these are fairly old data, um, known to be at risk of extinction. But when you look out of the total, um, almost a million species, but if you look at the proportion that are threatened compared to the proportion evaluated, three quarters of every species of, of the species of insects evaluated for their conservation status are in trouble. So the Endangered Species Act was enacted in 1973 with the purpose to conserve imperiled species and the ecosystems on which they depend, directs the U.S. government to list species as endangered or threatened, designate critical habitat, and to develop recovery plans. Uh, insects were not listed initially. Uh, the announcement that butterflies would be added to the list were not that was not exactly front page news in 1975. The first insect to be listed was the Shouse Swallowtail in 1976. Today there are 25 butterflies which represent, um, so uh, the 25 out of 575, 4.3% of, of, of U.S. butterflies are on the list. There's only one moth out of 11,000 species of American butter uh, moths. That's 0.009%. There's also one continental bee species and a continental fly among the pollinators that are um, uh, designated. So this is the, the moth that's in, endangered. It was listed in 2000. It's Manduca blackburni, uh, blackburn sphinx. It was once found throughout the Hawaiian archipelago. It was thought to be extinct until 1984 when it was rediscovered in Maui and Hawaii. And it's thought that it was a victim of a bike control program for the tobacco hornworm, Manduca sexta, which looks an awful lot like the Blackburn, uh, Blackburn Sphinx. Similarly feeds on uh, plants in the Solanaceae, the tomato family. So a, a parasitic wasp was brought in to control tobacco hornworms and uh, attacked its close relative, Manduca blackburni, and led to its decline. Why is this consequential? Well, there is a plant in the Campanulaceae called Brighamia insignis, called the Alula, is critically endangered. It's endemic to Hawaii. It's found only on sea cliffs in Kauai, where brave botanists have to climb the cliffs and hand pollinate it, has no known pollinators. Uh, given its floral structure, it was probably pollinated by the Blackburn Sphinx and maybe another uh, uh, critically endangered sphinx called uh, the Fabulous Sphinx Moth um, uh, right here, 
which was also thought to be extinct until it was rediscovered. So today, you probably all know about the emerald ash borer, which is a threat to at trees in the ash genus Fraxinus. There are more than 20 lepidopterans, including five sphingids, these hawk moths, which are superb pollinators that may go extinct if their hosts go extinct. Now, we've known about the consequence um, of, of host plants going extinct, but the consequence of some insects going extinct, not just that they're, the plants they pollinate are in trouble, but the vertebrates that depend on them may be in trouble. And we've known this for 20 years now, um, more than 20 years. This is, goes back to two, uh, uh, 12 years ago, Birdwatch Canada, not a scientific journal, pointed out that aerial insectivorous birds seem to be in decline. Uh, here in two languages, as befits uh, Canadian publications, comparing um, uh, the uh, percentage uh, variation uh, trends uh, from uh, uh, past dates till uh, the present, you can see an increase that in well, uh, increasing numbers of declining birds. So uh, population declines were more conspicuous in, in insectivorous birds. Uh, and uh, in the intervening years, people have noticed that the decline in abundance of insects is paralleled by decline in birds. Here's a study that was done in Denmark, um, tropical forest fragments, um, where birds decline, where insects decline, birds decline. Big study published just last year in estimating, you may have seen it, um, and since 1970, the past 50 years, North America has probably lost about 3 billion birds. Uh, and uh, many of these, in fact, most of them are from taxa uh, groups that depend on uh, insects. So there's uh, um, sparrows, wood warblers, blackbirds, sparrow, uh, old world sparrows, finches, swallows, swifts, night jars, fly catchers, uh, thrushes, and the like. Okay, so in the few remaining minutes, how do we get people? to care about this. More than 10 years ago, it was considered challenging to get the public engaged. Um, and uh, because it was considered too complex, too detached from human interests. Uh, if you look at Google Trends, uh, insect conservation has, uh, or insect apocalypse has not really uh, maintained its uh, uh, much in the way of, uh, of um, a focus on Google Trends, although Save the Bees rather than the bee apocalypse um, uh, has continued to trend, which is promising. So according to one study, nearly 90% of Americans are willing to help save animals from extinction, but not sure how to help. So maybe the problem is not that people don't want to uh, help or don't care, they just don't know how to help. Uh, and another barrier, I guess, is that uh, uh, there is a small percentage of, of the population that care and are active, and they're the ones most likely to respond uh, to efforts to preserve or protect biodiversity. So we're reaching, we're preaching to the choir, essentially. We're not reaching the groups that are yet, are not yet engaged in in conservation. How do, we, how do we message them? How do we reach them? Well, I think part of the problem is doing something just to save pollinators might seem like a lot of work. And I say this because we'll look on the web. Here you have three ways to boost pollination, four ways you can help, five key ways, six simple ways, seven easy ways, eight ways you can save bees. At the very least, it might be time consuming. Here's 10 ways to protect the pollinators or even overwhelming, 20 simple ways to save pollinators, um, that may be too much for most Americans. Some of these tips are, are misguided. Here from a wiki on how to sa help save honeybees, this advice, leave beehives alone when you find them, don't go disturbing the bees or taking their honey or honeycomb, which is good advice, particularly because this is a hornet nest. It is not a bees, uh, a beehive, bees, honeybees, nest in cavities, you find them in tree holes. Um, this is the kind of nest a hornet um, builds, so if you go try to remove honey from this, you will be sorely disappointed. Um, 
otherwise misguided too. This is the, you've probably all heard about the murder hornet, Vespa mandarinia, which is an, in, an invasive species. It has shown up only in a few places in, in Washington state and in British Columbia. Uh, and uh, people are in such a panic that I've been getting I'm flooded with uh, queries from all over the country from people who are convinced that the murder hornet is, is here. They're called murder hornets, among other things, because they do attack bees, uh, honeybees, and slaughter them unmercifully. And they're, they're large. They're, they can be up to two inches long, and their stings are highly venomous. But they're, as far as we know, they're only in the Pacific Northwest in a few limited places. One of the pictures I got, this is actually a moth. It's a Cecid moth that is a very high, you know, high fidelity mimic of a, of a, a Polistes wasp. And here is a, um, this is actually a sawfly. It is a hymenopteran, but it is not a hornet. It does not sting. So even creating an action plan. Five minutes counts. left, May. Five minutes left. What's that? Five minutes left. Yeah, I, I, I'm wrapping up. Um, creating an action plan sounds complicated. So here's my advice, you know, seven steps. What should we do? How do we get people involved? Um, because so many insects are threatened by human activities, could declines be slowed by an inaction plan? Can we convince people to stop doing things they don't need to do that nonetheless involve time, energy, and economic investment that not doing can help save insects? So look at the causes. Uh, benign ignorance may be the greatest obstacle to surviving the insect apocalypse. Um, it could be the, at least one way to help pollinators to stop doing things that don't really need to be done. This is a disaster. Insect uh, bug zappers, the two studies I know of. Here's one that shows that uh, over uh, two nights in 1999 and 2002, um, the target mosquitoes, just 27 and 84 on the two nights. Chironomas, nine biting midge is almost 8,000, 10,000 killed in this sampling period. And they don't bother anybody. In fact, they're beneficial. They're important in maintaining aquatic insect uh, ecosystems. Fly fishermen love them because they're food for, uh, for fish. And yes, some of them are even pollinators, tiny, tiny chironomids. Moths, of course, are attracted uh, to light and to bug zappers. And in this study, 405 of them were killed um, in the sampling periods in 1999, including 62 noctuids, uh, 30 Saturnians and 300 pyralins. As for agricultural intensification and pesticide use, uh, seed treatments, according to a 2014 study, provide negligible over, overall benefits to soybean production, and yet systemic seed treatments um, are, are known to cause problems for uh, pollinators of all, particularly bees, uh, uh, and all visitors to agroecosystems. Lawns. Lawns, uh, U.S. has more acreage of lawn and turf grass than corn, soybean, orchard, vineyard, and nut trees put together. And per acre, lawns receive more pesticide applications than agricultural land. Um, and yet, not planting a lawn, uh, not paying money for maintenance, not expending energy to mow, um, you can be replaced with flowering bee lawns that require minimal maintenance and maintain bio pollinator biodiversity. Just not mowing actually increases biodiversity. And uh, some of the plants that are killed by weed killers are actually amazing resources for pollinators. So dandelions and white clover in central Kentucky, 50 different species of insect pollinators, including 37 bee species, and two of the six bumblebees are uncommon and possibly in decline. Um, weed laws are hard to deal with. They began proliferating in the 1970s. Uh, there is a case to be made for allowing um, private property to maintain natural uh, communities of, uh, for, uh, in place of manicured lawns. You, planting uh, species that are more appropriate for the, the, uh, the soil and climate considerations of, of the area. People want to conserve. And even politicians should realize not reversing executive offers can be as helpful as passing laws to protect pollinators. Uh, the executive order saving bear's ears, which is a national monument, bear's ears got restricted to a tiny fraction um, of its, uh, uh, by a recent reversal of an Obama era um, uh, executive uh, order. And bear's ears monument 
that one location has more bee species in the entire East Coast. Um, we still need to protect habitat, but maybe more people can be recruited to not do things in order to help insects. So the concept of not doing anything harmful is venerable. It's the guiding ethical principle in medicine. Maybe it could work as well in insect population health. Um, searching Google without insects, humans would die is 75 million uh, results. We're maybe we're woke enough now to prioritize studies of the animals that constitute the bulk of a planet's biodiversity and leave the apocalyptic fiction to fiction where it belongs. And I thank you for listening and it's two o'clock, so thanks. Very good, thank you. Sorry, uh, I just love this topic so much. I sometimes put too much in. No, no worries, no worries. Uh, we're ready for questions. Go ahead, Elizabeth. Okay, um, uh, how do we get local homeowners to give up all the law lawn care products we use on our lawns? After a two year sabbatical on these products on my lawns, I notice worms coming back into <laughs> the soil as a bird sampler for the last 20 years. I too have noticed how many bird species have disappeared from my yard. You, you know, that I, I do not understand lawns. It is a bizarre obsession. Um, I can understand golf courses, but uh, even golf courses can be more pollinator friendly. Um, it's so much easier to not have a lawn. And, and uh, I don't think people realize. It's just, uh, it's kind of, um, if you were, uh, just use every opportunity, um, to tell to show them the difference people don't do well if you tell them what to do but it's remarkable how many people really like bees i was astonished to learn that uh, national geographic did a a survey of people asking if you could save one organism on the planet what would you save and the they were expecting you know tigers or elephants or charismatic vertebrates it was the honeybee so there is, I think, a fundamental appreciation um, of at least pollinators, at least bees and butterflies, that somehow gets lost, gets drummed out of people. So if you could uh, just keep being natural, master naturals, keep being mas um, master gardeners, because that's the best evidence of uh, why Lawns are not worth the time, energy, and resources that they consume. Thank you very much. Um, is, is your PowerPoint going to be available? Are we going to have um, uh, a copy of it later? Uh, well, Amanda already has a copy of it. It's not the exact version, but it's close enough. Uh, because there were a number of um, slides where you had references that were yep. really, really interesting to many people. And many people want to say thank you. It was absolutely wonderful. Oh, good, good. Sorry it was a little longer than it should have been. <laughs> Just uh, another question. Um, do you happen to know if deer away has any impact on pollinators of any type, insects of any kind? I'm sorry, if what has? Uh, deer away. It's, uh, it's a spray that... Oh, a deer uh, repellent? Yes. Oh, gosh. I, I, do you know what's in it? No. Oh, okay. Well, I that I don't exactly know. I could uh, I could look it up, I'm, uh, but uh, <laughs> I guess people use deer away because of deer ticks, or why do oh, you? No, because the deer are oh, you're gardeners, right? Because you don't want them eating the right. Yeah, good point. Okay, um, I don't know. I don't know what's in it. Okay, um, uh, you you answered us that loss of white and green ash are um, depleting a certain number of insects. Um, would it help for us to bring in um, prickly ash or some other uh, blue ash or a similar? Ah, prickly ash and blue ash are different families. Prickly ash is a citrus and the citrus family, Rutaceae. It's a bad name. It's not an ash at all. Um, same thing with wafer ash. Uh, so the ash is fraxinus, different, different uh, yes. genus, different family. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, if the thing about what I've noticed, um, both of those plants used to be mo more abundant in uh, forest understory, 
but they've been driven out by a honeysuckle and that's a noxious invade the bush honeysuckle and two species of noxious invasion invasive um, uh, shrub that just takes over forest understory and displaces native shrubs and and produces fruits that are less um, nutritious and suitable for birds and, and other wildlife so uh, yes bringing in the, those rutaceous shrubs would be great uh, their work, emerald ash borer is, is a very challenging pest species and uh, nothing has worked so far, but there are some hints at uh, resistance genes in some populations of, um, of uh, North American ash. And I know that is probably the most um, promising line of research. Oh, here's a recipe for deer repellent. Oh, it's garlic. It's a home dyed. Yeah, I don't know what deer away is commercially. Yes. Okay. Um, you mentioned bug zappers. Um, yeah. I think pointless. you also had some pointless. Absolutely pointless. Pictures of um, yard lights. Do you know if the intermittent la yard light that um, only responds to movement does that do less harm to um, insects? Is that us? No. Uh, sorry. Um, that that there's a there's a bit of, of um, controversy about about uh, light pollution and and its impact on insects. And the thing about insects is you can find a species to illustrate just about any impact. So it's very hard to generalize. This is what happens when people say we had a really cold winter. Is it gonna is is that good or bad for the insects? And the answer is yes. It depends on what species you're talking about. So. Um, Intermittent light actually, uh, in some species, can uh, disrupt the uh, life cycle in that long periods of un uninterrupted darkness are necessary uh, to trigger some of the uh, physiological changes to prepare insects for oncoming winter. But um, constant illumination is also a direct cause of mortality because uh, in moths in particular, many insects are attracted to light. and uh, then that causes just outright mortality. So uh, the overall impact of light is a little hard to say, but the more natural you can make something, the better off everybody is. And it's <laughs> nice to talk to people called naturalists. So, <laughs> is, is there a list of um, trees that are most useful or plants that are most useful to um, provide habitat for the insects, given that we understand one of the problems is, is um, breakup of the... Yes, fragmentation of habitat, yes. absolutely. Um, and in fact, a number of studies over the last 20 years, 20 years have shown that um, connections are really important. You don't necessarily, uh, it, if it's impossible um, to prevent the fragmentation of habitat, build in corridors to connect fragments and you can maintain considerably more biodiversity than without cor corridors and they don't have to be large body you know um bodies of land just enough so that insects can move uh, and other forms of of wildlife uh at, in terms of resources for uh pollinators tree species ab absolutely the i'm pretty sure I don't know if it's available on the pollinator pollinarium website, but um, yes, there there are many guides. You know where you can find it is the Pollinator Partnership, the North American Pollinator Protection Campaign, NAPCI, N A P P C, has all kinds of uh, guides and lists and and resources if you're looking for uh, recommendations for. Uh, or planting guides to promote um, pollen, pollinators. You know, not, uh, 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 there's a diversity of pollinator types, which would demand a diversity of planting types. But that information, I'm sure you can find in the uh, North American Pollinator Protection Campaign (NAPPC) website. I've just uh, put it into the chat. So. Oh, okay. No, thank you. And thank you, May. Um, oh, sure. Before you go through the um, chat comments, because so many people are grateful for your oh. talk. 
It, it was magnificent. Oh, no, uh, no, it was a little bit bumpy and uh, a little bit too long. So, but thank no. you for your, thank yeah. you for listening. And uh, thank you. Was, I have, um, I kind of reassembled this from a, 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 an earlier talk and it was, it was fun to do. So thank you for um, this opportunity to speak during the summer because it's, everything else was canceled. Right? So, so <laughs> it's a uh, good summer. And thank you again, May. We're very grateful. Thanks everybody. Uh, stay safe, stay healthy and enjoy the, enjoy the plants and the pollinators. Bye everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.